Good morning, church. It is so good to be here. And what's even better is the thought that next week, maybe we will really be here. That's my hope. Uh, that's that's my heart's desire is that is that uh, a few of us at least will be able to be gathering together. I know some of you will probably choose to stay home for a while, but it's our heart's desire to make it work, to figure out a way for as many of us as possible to be together uh, next Sunday morning. And I'm really looking forward to that, and I encourage you to be be watching for more information later this week. Well, this morning we're, we're going to be talking about the end times. It, it seems that that everywhere we turn, uh, people are, are either making statements or asking questions that relate to the end times. And, and probably well, one of the biggest questions that I'm seeing is this, are we near the end or is this the end of all things? And so this morning I wanted to take some time to uh, take a look at some of the questions that I see that are are rolling around out there and, and take a look at what does scripture say about this? Not what do I think or, or, or what could maybe possibly uh, be, but what does scripture say? So when it comes to the question, is this the end or, or is this the beginning of the end of all things? I guess really the answer depends on what you mean by the end. I think what most people mean when they ask that question is this, is this the beginning of the tribulation? Uh, that time period that scripture talks about in the book of Revelation, is, is that the end? That, that, that we're seeing coming about in the midst of our days. Well, really, the tribulation itself is not the end. Uh, the tribulation actually will be followed by over a thousand more years of history. And no, this isn't the tribulation. The tribulation, at least as it's described by Jesus, is something that is going to be far more drastic than even the things that we are seeing and experiencing today. Grab your Bibles. I'm going to be going through a lot of different passages, and I'm hoping that you'll be able to keep up uh, flipping back and forth between passages this morning. The, the references will be up on the screen for you to kind of help you uh, navigate as we go. But turn first to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Uh, there in verse 21, Jesus says this, For at that time there will be great distress, uh, the kind that hasn't taken place from the beginning of the world until now and never will again. And so when we ask, is this the end? Is this the tribulation? Well, Jesus says this, that time will be so intense that never in the history of the world before that time will things like this have ever taken place. Well, certainly, history has seen worse times than what we've experienced you know, in the past couple of months. I, running out of toilet paper is not quite cataclysmic, okay? It, you know, it, there, there have been worse times, and certainly as we read in the book of Revelation about the things that literally will take place during that time of tribulation, Things are going to be far, far worse than they are today. So this isn't the beginning of the tribulation. But is it the end times? Well, biblically, we have been in the end times since the ascension of Christ. Take a look with me. Turn in your Bible, James chapter 5. James chapter 5, and there in verse 8, listen to, the, to what James says. He says, um, you also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. James says almost 2,000 years ago that the Lord's coming is near. Oh, well, let's see what Paul says. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Turn over to 1 Corinthians there in chapter 10 in verse 11. And what we're going to find there is what Paul says is these things happened to them as examples, speaking of things in the past of history, and they were written for our instruction on whom the ends of the ages have come. Paul says that it, he and his contemporaries 
were those upon whom the end of the ages, the end of times had come. And so really what the Bible talks about is ever since Christ resurrected and then ascended to heaven, we entered into what the Bible calls the end times. Now, why would the Bible consider all of this huge amount of history to be the end times? Well, it's this. You see, Jesus is victorious. He has won the battle already. Jesus is sovereign. He is unstoppable. And he can step back into history whenever he chooses. Whenever God the Father says it's time, God the Son can step back into history. There is nothing that can hold him back. There is nothing that has to happen first to take place first. This is what we call the concept of imminence imminence, meaning that Christ can return at any time. That's why in Revelation chapter 22, there in verse 12, Jesus says it himself. He says, I am coming soon. I'm coming soon. And yet you and I, we read that. And if we're thinking, we think, well, wait a minute. Jesus said that almost 2,000 years ago, but he hasn't come back yet. He hasn't come back yet. Well, let me help you understand that a little bit better. You see, that word that is translated here as soon, in the Greek, that word most literally means quickly. It means quickly, suddenly, unexpectedly, or fast. In fact, many Bible translations use the word quickly there. Jesus says, behold, I'm coming quickly. Uh, another use of that word is in Matthew 28.8. There it talks about the women who went to Jesus' tomb. Remember, we talked about this just the other day at Easter. And it talks about, so they departed quickly from the tomb. They were there. They discovered the tomb was empty, that Jesus has ridden, and they quickly left the tomb. They didn't hang around. It happened quickly. It's that same word. It's that same word. It means fast or sudden or without warning. You see, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 Verse 2 says this, For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will just come like a thief in the night. That's what, that's what Jesus is saying when he says, I'm coming quickly. He says it's going to be without warning. You know, if a thief is coming to prowl your car in the middle of the night, he doesn't send you a text message a week ahead of time to find out if you're open for that. You know, he doesn't schedule an appointment. It comes without warning. And so, too, will be the second coming of Christ without warning. You know, it's kind of like it is for many of you who go out and go hunting. You get up early in the morning and you get all ready and you get out into your blind and you're sitting there maybe with a round chambered. And then you wait. You wait. And you might wait a long time or you might not. You don't know. You, you don't know, but you have to be ready. You have to be ready. If you take a little nap, that deer's going to walk by and you're never going to know. If, you're, if you get on your smartphone and start playing Angry Birds or whatever it is you do on your smartphone, it, you know that it, that opportunity, that moment may come and go before you're able to respond. And so too, it is with the return of Christ. He is coming and he will come quickly. And so scripture tells us, be ready, be ready, pay attention, be watchful. You know, a lot of people are asking as well that if, if these are the end times, but not necessarily the end of all things, then, then what's next? What should we be looking for? Well, what should we expect? Well, I would say that the next thing that we should be looking for is the rapture of the church, or, or maybe possibly, honestly, maybe possibly the battle of Gog of Magog. Uh, both of these events have no prophetic antecedents. In other words, there's nothing that has to happen before these things can take place. Who knows when all of these things of the end will begin to take place. Well, Jesus said in Matthew 24, turn there, Matthew 24, verse 36, Jesus says that no one knows. None of us, anyway, no one knows. 
No one knows when these things are going to begin to take place. Not even the angels of heaven, and this is amazing, nor even the Son. Jesus says, even I, in, in my humanity, I don't know. He says, but the Father only. Only the Father knows when. But we do know this, that ever since the ascension of Christ back up to heaven after the resurrection, we have been in those end times. We've been in a period of time that scripture, uh, we, we call it the church age because it is a time when scripture tells us that God is dealing with the church, uh, which will continue, as Romans eleven twenty five 25 tells us, until the fullness, until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. So think about this. All through the Old Testament, what do we see God focused on? We see God focused upon his people, Israel. But then there's a change. There's a change that takes place in the, with the New Testament. And we see God focusing upon the church, and the church that is mostly Gentile, the church that is moving throughout the world, but... Scripture tells us this, that there is going to come a time when that last Gentile believer will, will come to Christ. And then God will turn his attention back to Israel. And because as Romans 11 tells us, God is not done with his people. God isn't finished with Israel. So the, the church age, it ends with the rapture or the catching up of the church to be with God in heaven. Uh, that word rapture is a word that we get from the Latin translation of 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Uh, so when the Bible was translated into Latin, uh, that word rapture, that's the transliteration of the, of the Latin word, uh, transliteration means you change the letters from Latin to English. Translation means you change the word from Latin to English. If we transliterate, it goes from rapture to rapture. If we translate, it goes from rapture to caught up or caught away. And so it is this moment when God catches the church, he grabs the church, and he pulls them to be with him there in heaven. And Paul puts it this way, that we will be snatched up to meet with the Lord in the clouds. And those who have already gone to be with the Lord, they will be reunited with their resurrected and glorified bodies. And you and I, oh, oh, I'm hoping anyway, that the rapture is soon and that we will be amongst those who will suddenly go to be with him. We will leave this life and go into eternity without ever passing through death. And when this happens, when this happens, we will be changed. We will be changed into that moment into something more glorious than we can presently comprehend or even conceive. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul puts it like this. He says this, beginning in verse 42, what is sown is perishable, but what is raised is imperishable. What is sown is in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. Man, in this life, we know a lot about what it means to be perishable, to be fragile. We know what dishonor is, what weakness is. We know the limitations and the, and the pains and the aches of a natural body. But what Paul is saying is that in that minute, in that moment when we are raptured to be with the Lord, that we will, we will become imperishable. We will be raised in glory and in power, no longer limited with our physical bodies, but with a newly resurrected spiritual body. And it is, it is in that state of perfect fellowship with our creator that we will exist for all of eternity, without any of the hindrances of this present life. Uh, we, that is the great hope of the Christian. Understand this. Uh, we don't live just for this life. We are living for what is yet to come. 
That is what our eyes are cast on. That is what we are hopeful for. That is what we are looking forward to, is being freed from sin and brokenness and being united with our Savior, with our Creator for all of eternity. So, the rapture comes first. The rapture comes first, and it begins this season that Scripture refers to as the day of the Lord. All through the Old Testament, the prophets talk about the day of the Lord. Sometimes they, they call it the day of the Lord, the day or the great day of the Lord. It's that day when God will both punish all wickedness with his wrath, and he will rescue his people. Ezekiel 30 Verse 3 says this, for the day is near, the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom of the nations. The New Testament talks about the day of the Lord as well. Second Peter chapter 3 says this, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief and the heavens will pass away with a roar. And so the day of the Lord, it's that day when God will set things right, when he will punish evil and when he will rescue his people including his people Israel. The climax, the climax, of course, of this day of the Lord is the return of Christ. It's the return of Christ. Now understand this, at the rapture, Christ comes, but he does not return to the earth. He does not touch his foot to the earth. He meets us in the sky, scripture says, but at the return of Christ, the second coming of Christ, Christ does return to the earth. In fact, in Zechariah, the Old Testament prophet Zechariah, chapter 14, verse 4, it says that he will put his foot on the Mount of Olives, that he that will be the place that he will land when he returns physically to the earth. In Matthew chapter 24, uh, there in verses 29 through 31, as Jesus answers his disciples' questions about when it is that he will return to establish his kingdom. Jesus says this, immediately after the tribulation of those days, and there Jesus is speaking of the tribulation, that, that, that incredible time that the book of Revelation talks about. He says the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Understand, this isn't like the rapture. This isn't this, this glorious, joyful meeting of the Savior and his saved ones. No, this is, this is the return of the creator who has been spurned by his creation. And so it says they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He is coming in judgment, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect there. In context, it is speaking of Israel, not of the church. Well, what comes after that? Well, after Christ returns comes what we call the millennial reign of Christ. It's a thousand year period where Christ will reign on earth. It's described in Revelation chapter 20 as a very literal part of history. And then finally, at the end of Revelation 20, we read about the, the great judgment that will come. There in verses 11 and 12, John says this in Revelation, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and the dead were judged. So that's the program. That's the program. That's what's coming. And you might ask this as I've laid this out. You might ask, why do we believe that the rapture will come before the tribulation? You know, not everyone believes that. There are others who, who believe that things will play out differently from that. Uh, but why do we believe that the rapture will come before the tribulation? Well, I, the simple answer for me is that the, I believe that that is what Scripture clearly teaches. Now, of course, there are arguments for and against every perspective on this issue. Uh, the proponents of every position have numerous arguments as to why they're right and everyone else is wrong. Uh, but the post-tribulation 
thought, the mid-tribulation and the pre-wrath rapture, they all say that Jesus will take us to heaven after or during the tribulation. And because of that, they all share two major problems. First of all, the justice of God. And second of all, the imminency of Christ's return. Very briefly, let me explain this. These theories taint the justice of God. They taint the justice of God because if the church is in the tribulation, if the church is in the tribulation for one second, or for the whole of the seven years, it doesn't matter. If the church is in the tribulation, they will experience the wrath of God, which Jesus has already, already borne for us. The scripture tells us very clearly that Christ bore the punishment for our sin once for all. Once for all. That means you and I, we don't have to bear God's wrath for the punishment for our sin. 1 Peter 3.18 says this, Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. And so if God is just, and by the way, he is just, then we cannot suffer his wrath for our sin because the Savior has already suffered it. And that's why he promises us. And in Romans chapter 9, there in ver er, Romans chapter 5, there in verse 9, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood. We have been justified. We have been declared innocent by the blood of Christ. So much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God because we've been justified by the cross. We will be saved by Christ from the wrath of God. We won't experience the wrath of God. And let me tell you this, everyone, literally by what God's word says, everyone in the tribulation suffers the wrath of God. There is no escaping it. They're at the very beginning of the tribulation as things are just getting started. They really even haven't picked up steam. There in verse six, God hasn't even hardly started and yet people are giving up. Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful, who is that? And everyone. And everyone. Everyone who is alive on planet earth in that day, slave or free, they hide themselves and they call out to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. Who is they? Who is their wrath? Well, that's the face of him who sits on the seat of the throne. This is the wrath of God. The wrath of God. The perfectly just wrath of God will be poured out on everyone who is in the tribulation. And it says that at the very beginning of the tribulation. So, can we be in the tribulation? Well, not if God is just. Now, I'm not saying the Christians won't experience tribulation or trouble. We won't experience the tribulation, not the great tribulation, not that time that the, the book of Revelation tells us about, uh, but... But certainly, Scripture is clear. Jesus has promised us plenty of trouble. John 16, 33, Jesus says, Hey, in this world, you will have tribulation. But don't fear, because I've overcome the world. Paul warns in, in 2 Timothy 3, 12, that all who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted. John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19 says this, don't be surprised if they hate you because they hated me first. We will experience plenty of trouble. Now, secondly, all of those other theories, by definition, they also remove the imminency. Remember that immediate possibility, that, that, that reality that Christ could return at any time. They absolutely remove the imminency 
of the beginning of these things of the end. You see, it couldn't happen at any time if it is a mid-tribulation rapture or a post-tribulation rapture or a pre-wrath tribulation rapture because we would have to see at least something from the time of the tribulation. And so logically, if Christ does not return until after some of these things are taking place, then you and I can know that he cannot come back now. He cannot come back yet until those things begin to happen. And so, yes, I believe that the next thing that will take place and the thing that we need to be looking for is the rapture of the church. It's funny, the thing that I've seen that people wonder about the most in these past few weeks is, is Elon Musk the Antichrist? Or is it Bill Gates? Or are they competing for the title? You know, who is the Antichrist? Who's it going to be? And, and the question is, will we see the Antichrist? My answer to you would be no. I don't think that we will. At least we won't see him in power. And so we won't know that he's the Antichrist. Hey, guys, if you know who the Antichrist is, you've missed the rapture. <laughs> you, you've missed the most important thing not to miss. I don't think that we will see the Antichrist because of what we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, let's turn there just really quick. 2 Thessalonians there in chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 8, listen to what Paul writes. He says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be easily upset or troubled either by a prophecy or by a message or by a letter supposedly from us alleging that the day of the Lord has come. Don't let anyone deceive you in that way, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. So what Paul is talking about here is the, the, the return of Christ, the second coming of Christ, and the revealing of the man of lawlessness, and that something else has to take place before the Antichrist is revealed. He says, the man doomed to destruction, he opposes and exalts himself every, um, above every so-called God or object of worship so that he sits in God's temple, proclaiming that he himself is God. And then Paul says, don't you remember that when I was still with you, I used to tell you about this, and you know what currently restrains him. There's something that is holding back this man of lawlessness, this Antichrist, so that he will be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but the one now restraining will do so until he is out of the way. And then, and then the lawless one will be revealed. So what could that be? It, well, it's a, it's a bit of a mystery, and it, Scripture does not spell it out for us, but I think that we can logically come to some reasonable conclusions here. I think that we can, we can see that there is no one who could hold back the Antichrist except for God himself. And that's not something you can do or I can do, but that's got to be something that God himself would do. And, but God can't be moved out of the way. That, that presents us with a problem. How can it be that God is the one who holds back the Antichrist, and yet this one who holds him back is going to be moved out of the way? Well, the only solution that I can come up with is that what this is talking about is the Holy Spirit resident within the church. That he's talking about the church being here, and that is what restrains uh, this evil one, this Antichrist, from being revealed until we are moved out of the way and the abiding of the Holy Spirit within us is taken with us. Now, 1 John 2.18, John tells us that though the Antichrist is not yet arrived, that there are Antichrists that there are those who are playing on that team, if you will, who are working toward his ends that we will see. So we will see no end of evil men doing evil things. But I don't think that we will know who the Antichrist is until we're seeing it from heaven.
probably the most troubling question that gets asked these days is this. How much worse are things going to get? How much worse are things going to get? That's an interesting question because we don't really know. We don't really know, but we can, we can guess they're going to get worse. They're going to get a lot worse. Jesus refers to these things that we're experiencing, to the plagues and to the natural disasters, to the wars and rumors of wars, as birth pangs, as birth pangs. Here's the thing about birth pangs. You don't know how bad they're going to get until they've come and gone. What we can know is this. We're not experiencing God's wrath. What we are experiencing is the churning of this world as we come to that moment when everything will change. And things are going to get crazy. You know, Jesus describes it in Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, uh, there in verses 6 through 8. Jesus, Jesus says this. You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed because these things must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And all of these events are the beginning of labor pains. It's interesting in, in Luke chapter 21 there in verses 7 through 11 it is it is. Jesus is talking about the same thing. It's a, the same answer that he's giving, but he includes their plagues as well. Yeah, that, that's appropriate to our day, isn't it? But notice that he compares these things to birth pangs, to something that increases in frequency and intensity as time goes on. So should we expect things to get worse? Yes, we should. We should expect it and we should be ready for it. We should be ready for it, though, not in order to make this world our heaven, but in order to make the biggest difference we can while we are here. We should be ready for things to get worse, and not so that we can have the best life possible here on earth, but so that we can make the best use possible of the season that God has given us to be his ambassadors here. Some might be wondering, if there is any evidence, if there's anything going on out in the world that would point us not to the imminency of Christ's return, but to the immediacy of Christ's return. Is there anything out there going on that would, that would lead us to believe not only that Christ could come at any moment, but that would begin to lead us to believe that Christ is possibly coming very soon. And I would say yes. I would say that I see signs all around us. And, and we, could, we could dig in and go through the news and, and go through hours and hours of things that point us uh, towards the things that the scripture talks about uh, that will be in play during the time of the tribulation, during the time of the end. You, you know, the... Scripture talks about it in Revelation 13, in Daniel 2 and 7, in, in, in all sorts of places about there being one world government, one world religion, one world currency. And it does so through some very colorful pictures of beasts and horns and leaders rising up. And we are certainly seeing movement in our day uh, towards a one world government, towards one world currency, not so much towards one world religion, uh, though I think that will all be tied together. Uh, I think it's very interesting. Um, you know, there were different times when we looked at the uh, European Union or the European Economic um, Confederacy, uh, and we thought, oh, well, this has got to be the the 10 nation confederacy the scripture talks about, then it grew past 10 and that kind of messed everything up. And, and yet there is, there is a lot of discontent among the EU right now. England just jumped out. Italy is, is pretty upset over the way they, they didn't get help 
from the rest of the EU. Uh, we, we definitely see change going there. It's interesting, Gordon Brown, who is a former prime minister of the UK, he came out this uh, just a couple weeks ago saying very openly and very plainly that it is time for a one world government. It is time for a one world government to begin to deal with the issues that we're facing. We're certainly seeing a, a lot of movement towards a, a one world cashless digital monetary system. You know, money is the, the dirtiest thing that, that we have. And, and, you know, this whole coronavirus thing, uh, they, they speculate that a lot of transfer of the virus happens uh, on paper money. You, know, you can't buy coffee with paper money here locally. You got to use a credit card because no one wants to touch your dirty money. We see a lot of other signs as well. We see the stage being set for the things that we read about in Ezekiel 38 and 39, that battle of, of Gog from Magog. We see Turkey and, and Russia growing and, and kind of striving for influence in that whole region. Um, we see Iran and Sudan and Libya, all nations that are mentioned in that prophecy in, in Ezekiel 38 and 39. We see them all gathering together and forming coalitions and kind of battling for power in that region. And we see Israel becoming more and more wealthy and a, a more and more prime target uh, for them to go after. And so we see the stage being set. So the stage is set. Christ could come for his church at any time. We see that uh, the things that we read about taking place during the Great Tribulation, though maybe 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, we couldn't imagine how those things could take place. Yet right now they seem like uh, not distant possibilities, but very clear um, things that could take place easily. So the question I would ask is this, how should we be responding? You and I, the body of Christ, how should we be responding since the end is imminent? It could come at any time. Well, obviously we should be living our lives for eternity and not for this life. This life is coming to an end. More than ever, we see that this life is a paper plate. And so it's gonna go in the trash. If things in this world are going to come to a close at some point. We don't know when, but because of that, we want to live every minute that God does give us, not for this world, not for this life, but for eternity. Listen, understand, you could live a long life. Remember, what we are talking about here is imminence, not immediacy. So live every moment. Live every moment understanding that you live on the brink of eternity. I don't think we should view it as a car racing toward a cliff, but rather a car racing at 90 miles per hour along the side of a cliff. And all it would take is a subtle little jog of the wheel and we would plunge off into eternity. So since we live on the edge of eternity, how should we live? Uh, Peter asks that question. Second Peter chapter three says this, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise and the elements will burn and be dissolved and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct, and godliness as you wait for the day of God and hasten its coming. So what, what Peter is talking about is that how we live, who we are, should be impacted by our understanding of the fact that we live on the brink of eternity. So what will that look like? Well, love others. Love others as Jesus loved us. That's what he's told us to do. Uh, expect evil days and, and be willing to be Christ's representative in the midst of this world regardless. Let me ask you this. If your life were to end today, what regrets would you have? What things would be left undone that you would have wished had been done? 
Or let me put it this way. If you were to view your life for a moment, how you're spending your time, what your priorities are, where you're investing yourself, if you were to view these from the perspective of eternity, in the light of eternity, instead of from the perspective of this life, would you change anything? Would you change how you are spending yourself would you give yourself your time, your resources differently than you are? You see, God calls us to live ready, to live ready to be with him at any time, to live ready for eternity. Are you? Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says that we are sons of light. And it's in the context of the fact that we need to be ready for eternity at any moment. He says that you are not in darkness, brothers, for the day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. We're of the day, not of the night. That's what Paul is saying. We are to live aware of our surroundings, and that we live in a world that is wrecked by sin, we need to live aware of our situation that we are to be Christ's ambassadors amidst this lost and dying world. And the living of our lives needs to be shaped by that realization. Here's the thing, though. Spring is coming. Some of you, you thought you had coronavirus. You actually just had allergies, right? For a couple of days, you were you know, checking your will. You were you know, kind of freaking out a little bit. Uh, but now you're in an even worse state. You're on allergy medicine. Have you been around anyone on allergy medicine lately? Uh, their sinuses are clear, but their head is clogged. They can't think. They can't think. They, they, they're sitting in a fog. They're breathing freely, but they are utterly unaware of everything around them. That's a problem. That's a problem. And it's a far bigger problem if that's true of you spiritually. You know, it's one thing to be groggy, lethargic, foggy because of allergies. It's another thing to be spiritually groggy, spiritually, spiritually lethargic, spiritually foggy, because of your contact with the things of this world. It's those allergens, it's all that pollen, it's, it's, it's you know the life of this world that causes our allergies to act up, but so too, it's, it's the stuff of this world that, that, that causes us to become groggy headed spiritually. The problem with it is that quite often we we go around groggy and unaware. That, that's the problem with being groggy or the problem with being deceived. You don't realize it. You don't realize how bad you are until someone comes up to you and they, they, wonders if you're, they wonder if you're in a coma. You know, you, you're just so unresponsive. Maybe it's time for us to ask the Lord to show us if there is anything in our life that is dulling us spiritually. Anything that is keeping us from being clear and clear-headed spiritually. Is there some area of life that is shrouded in darkness? Is there anything that you're hiding? Is there a, a pattern of secret sin within your life? It's time to bring it out into the light. It's time to be of the day and not of the night. It's time to confess it to God as sin. It's time to turn away from it. To come into accountability with a mature brother or sister in Christ. To confess your sin one to another, as Scripture says. It's time to, to cut off your access, to shut down your opportunity. To quit hiding, to quit excusing. No more. It's time to live in the light. It's time to be children of the light because we see 
that our Savior is coming. Our Savior is coming, and we are his representatives. Is how we're living, and especially in the midst of this craziness of the pandemic, is how we're living focused on eternity or on time? Am I all uptight and focused on the things of time? Or am I focused on issues of eternity? And no matter where you stand on the pandemic, no matter what you think of coronavirus, the danger is that our focus would be on the things of this world. Whether you're focused upon, I don't want to catch this thing, and this is terrible, and life is, it's just, and you're, you're just consumed with fear. Or you're, you're, you're on the other end of the spectrum, and you're just like, this is all nonsense, and, and you can't curtail my freedoms. It, we can become so absorbed in the things of this life that we lose track of the things that really matter of being an ambassador for Christ in the midst of whatever situation he allows us to find ourselves in. Let's represent him well. Let's, as we see his coming get closer and closer, be more and more useful tools to him as he seeks to reach the lost and to grow his body. Let's pray. Father. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that we have something to look forward to that is better than this life. And that we, we get to look forward to not only a great place to go, not only a great change within ourself, but more than anything, a great God to be with and to worship. God, we long for being in each other's presence. Lord, we ask that you'd bring that soon. More than anything, we long for your presence. We long to physically be in your presence. We look forward to eternity. We look forward to being in your presence, not because we've earned it, not because we deserve it, but because of the Savior, because of his shed blood, because he gave his life as a payment for our sin, that you welcome us into your presence. We thank you for that, Lord. I pray that until that day comes, when we see you face to face, that we would represent you well here. Work within us, Lord. I pray that you would speak to us from the things that we've looked at in your word. And Father, we would respond to you. 